as, as we all know, the U.S. Supreme Court has recently heard arguments both for and against President Obama's health care reform initiative, known as the Affordable Care Act. Um, I guess one of the provisions of this that's sort of gotten a lot of the attention, particularly in the in the court case, is the inv individual mandate, which requires all adults to buy health insurance either through their employers or by buying it themselves. So can you talk to me about, I mean, what are your feelings about the provision as it stands in this act? And I mean, are you in favor of it? And why or why not? See, yeah, well, first of all, in the spirit of division of labor, I need to say that uh, the, the primary arguments for and against the individual mandate are lawyer arguments, not economist arguments. So I'm going to speak about it as an economist. But the key issues that I think were debated before the Supreme Court, like does is it constitutional to affirmatively make a person buy something or is it how far does the interstate commerce clause extend? Um, I'm not an expert on that. Uh, th there are, though, two reasons, two good reasons to have uh, the individual mandate in any kind of um, health reform legislation. Uh, the one which has gotten the most discussion recently is, um, is uh, kind of as a um, – uh, 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 an important, um, whether it's necessary or not, we could debate, but an important adjunct of a provision of the legislation which essentially says uh, insurers um, have to charge everybody the same premium uh, no matter what the risk level. And uh, the problem with that, of course, is that if you're an average person and the av this is not some kind of reverse Lake Wobegon where we're all sicker than average, the average person is reasonably healthy. If the premium is high enough to cover the cost of the uh, cr people with chronic conditions, it'll look like a bad deal to a lot of um, of those people, and uh, so you you need, uh, in a way, some muscle uh, to tell them you have to buy the insurance anyway, even though it doesn't sound like such a good deal to you. Uh, so that's one reason. The other reason, which was actually more important when we first considered this 20 years ago, essentially it arises because even if you were an average risk person and the premiums were tailored to your risk, well, I don't know about you or me, but we know that mm, somewhere between 3 and 4 percent of people just don't get the idea that they ought to have insurance. Uh, and we know that when they're offered a really good deal as part of their job, they only have to pay a few hundred dollars a month. There still will be um, uh, 3 or 4 percent of workers who will turn it down and not get insurance any anywhere. Uh, and that uh, Why are they doing that? Well, one reason probably is um, – Unlike me, they don't get up every morning and think about health insurance. They think they're healthy, and uh, why buy insurance if you're healthy? And there's also the view that, uh, well, if I get really sick, no, there, nobody's going to leave me bleeding in the street. And in fact, federal law requires you to be treated uh, at an emergency room and stabilized regardless of your ability to pay. And so uh, people will rely on, in a way, on the charity of others uh, to compensate for the, the fact that they don't have insurance. It's still, I tell people, it's still a terribly bad idea to run around without health insurance no matter what you are and no matter matter how much you count on charity, but the one good feature of charity is at least it's cheap if you're the object of charity. So we actually, uh, we originally called our proposal a proposal for responsible national health insurance because we thought that it was important to have a mandate in a way to deal with irresponsible behavior on the part, I have to say, of a small minority of the population. Uh, surprisingly, not necessarily the poorest people, uh, just the people who don't have the idea that they need insurance. Uh, they, they, the, they, uh, the non-poor uninsured tend to be people who don't buy other kinds of insurance. They don't have life insurance either. They don't have insurance on their cars. They live from paycheck to paycheck. They're maxed out on their credit cards, even if they have a pretty decent income. And so and, uh, since the challenge at that time was to come up with a plan to get universal health insurance coverage, we thought that it was important to have a mandate to kind of round up the stragglers. Mm -hmm. Now, there's so much, I mean, there's so many other provisions to this law besides the individual yeah. mandate. I mean, can you tell me, I mean, what is your opinion of this act overall? And what do you think the impact would be, I mean, if the Supreme Court strikes down the individual mandate or if it strikes down the whole law, yeah. what, what is the impact yeah, on that? Yeah, so I'm really worried, actually, that um, the good, there's some really good parts to the law. And um, in some ways, um, 
the the uh, features that 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 are around the individual mandate uh, because they were put in there run the risk of bringing down the whole edifice so the part that at least in my opinion is very desirable is a part that's actually not been very much discussed the law is going to provide hundreds of billions of dollars worth of subsidies to not just to poor people but to lower middle income people to help them afford health insurance and I guess my view is as a, as a human being and as a moral person, uh, I think it's um, just um, uh, socially undesirable and morally undesirable for people to go without highly beneficial care when it exists. And, um, and, and the, most of the heavy lifting in the, in the law to get people insured comes not from the individual mandate really, but from the fact that if you can't afford insurance, the government's going to step in and, and really give you major help to afford it. Uh, the, the, as I said, the, the mandate mostly just kind of rounds up the, uh, the people who aren't persuaded enough by an enormous subsidy that they ought to go ahead and get insurance. So uh, that part, uh, in a way, uh, what I call paying higher taxes in order to have a clean conscience is, in my view, the most important part of legislation. And it would be a real a tragedy, I think, if all the other things that were added onto it for various reasons kind of brought down the main uh, objective. And now, I mean, if the I mean, if the court strikes down part of the law or all of the law, I mean, what is the impact on businesses? What is the impact on consumers? And I mean, is there a way that you see that Congress and the administration could kind of come together and come up with something that might be able to stick that everybody could agree on? Oh, I I think my, my view is, but. Uh, I, I think I'm not the only person that there are a lot if, – if we could just fix some things, uh, we could have something that would make sense. Uh, uh, there's, of course, a political choice whether you think the best way to fix it is to throw the whole thing out and start over. I hope still retaining uh, generous subsidies to the people who need help to buy health insurance or whether you think you could somehow uh, adjust a bunch of the other provisions of the law in order to make it possible to do that. That's kind of a political choice. Um, I think uh, you know, the, if, the, if the centerpiece of the law is the subsidies, I think it's certainly possible to design the other parts of it to um, do two things. One is just be much simpler. Uh, the problem was, uh, as you can imagine, it's after all, it's our elected representatives in Congress. They hung all sorts of things in, on the legislation that have little to do with the uninsured and a lot to do with uh, various crusades that they might be engaging in. And, uh, and that complication, I think, has just been uh, very harmful to, the, uh, to the generating support for the law. It's just gotten so complicated. And then there, there is one thing in the law that's related to the mandate that I think could have been done a lot better and that kind of gets back to the point I was making a few minutes ago. The purpose of the mandate is to force people who are relatively low risk uh, to, to pay more for their insurance. Uh, well, why do we want to do that? Well, there is a good social reason to do it for people who are unusually high risk, especially if they're not very well off. Um, they can't afford to pay an insurance premium that would reflect their risk. So we want to cross-subsidize them. Uh, the problem, I think, with the way it's in the legislation is uh, it's what I call the dumbest possible way to do a good thing. We're trying to make a transfer to people who need some help to buy insurance because they're high risk. And the way we, the legislation does it is, in effect, by taxing people who are low risk. And then the people who are low risk don't want to pay the tax. And uh, the alternative, which actually exists in the legislation, is to create a pool for high risks where if you are a high risk person, you have diabetes, say, or some serious chronic condition, you can go there and buy insurance at reasonable premiums. And the subsidy comes not from making insurance expensive to low risk, it comes from raising taxes the way we usually raise taxes on people based on their ability to pay or at least based on their willingness to pay uh, for, uh, to help out others. So, um, yeah, so, so, the, so the main uh, part I think that, that has been uh, harmful here is the, um, the way that the, the lawyers who drafted the legislation thought uh, that they would help out high risks was by punishing low risks and I think that was unnecessary. 
Now, I mean, what would you say? I mean, there's a lot of talk about who is sort of the main culprits with the problems facing the healthcare system, whether it's the insurance companies, the hospitals, the doctors, the government, the consumers. I mean, what do you what do you think? What do yeah. you think of the root of the problem? Well, insurance is? companies certainly were the designated enemies, right? Uh, and uh, and this the, the this sort of populist version even of the requirement that insurers cover high risks at the same premiums is well they'll how will insurers do that? Well, they'll do that just by taking the money out of their profits. We'll just make them do it. But of course, you can't make insurers really do anything. Uh, they'll turn around and charge the rest of us more, uh, which is um, what probably will happen when um, the uh, if 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 and when community rating uh, and the whether or not it has the individual mandate um, comes into play. Uh, so. So it's, it's really hard to kind of stick it to insurers because uh, as long as they have the ability to vary the premiums they charge and the law is not going to take that away, although it does have some provisions that they can't charge unreasonable premiums, but essentially the reason they charge a lot is when they have to pay out a lot. I mean, most of the money that goes to insurers comes back to us in the form of uh, health care claims. So, uh, you know, it's uh, certainly... Uh, commonplace to quote the horrible figures on the rate of growth in insurance premiums outrunning every other economic aggregate, although lately they've been slowing down a lot and people haven't been breaking out champagne all that much. Maybe they should. But the reason why insurance premiums rise rapidly for the most part is not because they're pocketing a lot more money than they used to. It's because they're paying out a lot more in claims. Why are they paying out a lot more in claims? Well, it's because you and I are going to the doctor not so much more, but to get more done at a higher price sometimes. Uh, and um, so, yeah, the main culprit for high health care costs in the U.S., it's easy, they're easy, it's easy to find that person, uh, find a mirror and look in it. And that'll be uh, one of the reasons why health care costs are high. Mm -hmm. And now, I mean, tell me, I mean, what would you say would be the one thing that we should do to tackle rising health care costs? I mean, can you point and can you point yeah, to initiatives so the, that the economist party line here is to say that the most serious um, impediment to uh, an economically efficient health care system is, of course, connected with health insurance. And the most serious impediment there is uh, there is a substantial tax break that goes to uh, that, that's generated if you get your insurance through your job, like all of us do, or almost all of us do, all but about uh, six percent of the privately insured get insurance through their job. And the beauty part of it is, uh, from the point of view of, uh, of, of an individual, is, um, well, so Penn pays uh, 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 or is able to uh, make payments toward my health insurance in such a way, I figure, to shield about $18,000 worth of income for me from taxes. Uh, my wife says we should send a Christmas card to the Treasury thanking them for that tax break. But the, the consequence of it is, in part, uh, uh, that uh, that I'm less uh, parsimonious than I might otherwise be in choosing insurance and in choosing health care because, in effect, the Treasury is sharing the cost. And this, this tax break, of course, it's a middle class tax break, so people who are mostly middle class don't see what's wrong with it, uh, but it has the consequence of... Uh, uh, providing a, 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 a pretty strong incentive for ordinary Americans not to be as careful about health care costs as they should be. And now very quickly, I mean, are there any initiatives going on anywhere that you could see that would that are in progress that would work well? I mean, a model that... that well, so a little bit of... Uh, uh, it actually surprised me and pleased me. Uh, there is in the legislation a provision not to take effect until 2018, but a provision to try to um, uh, take away the subsidy to employment-based health insurance for high, very high-cost employment-based health insurance, the so-called Cadillac tax. Uh, now, they didn't do it the right way. What they should have done was said, if you have a health plan that's um, uh, costing more than $22,000 a year, uh, at least some part of that ought to be treated as part of your taxable income, and th that will make you want to be more careful. Instead, partly for appearance's sake, they imposed a tax on insurance companies, but of course the insurance companies won't pay that tax. They'll shift it back to the employers, and then the employers will probably shift it back to us in the form of lower raises than we would otherwise get. So that was a good thing, although it's pretty 
pretty small and pretty long delayed. So if I were to rewrite things, I'd say give that a lot more muscle, uh, make it a lot more rational and move it up in time. And that's essentially what the two uh, deficit reduction committees uh, the, uh, proposed uh, to the Congress as, and to the president as well to change the tax treatment of employment-based health insurance. So that that would be my main thing. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, if you can make uh, – this is sort of a necessary condition, I think, for people to really – care about the cost of health care personally as opposed to being outraged about it generally. But if people did care more about their own personal cost of health care, then I think other things like better information about where can I get a reasonably good deal on health care would be something people would pay a lot more attention to than they do now.